Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the webinar, Condos Happen, How is Your Multifamily Practice at Risk? This is a webinar brought to you by AIA Contract Documents and the AIA Risk Management Committee. This presentation is protected by U.S. and international copyright laws. You will be receiving the PowerPoint and the recording from today's webinar within the next few days. This course is also eligible for one learning unit. When you registered for the course, you entered your AIA member number. We will use the information you provided to report your credit to the AIA directly, and it should appear on your online transcript within the next two weeks. I'd like to now turn it over to Craig Williams, one of our presenters, to introduce himself. Well, hello. Greetings, everyone. Um, of course, as Hasi just announced, I'm one of your presenters. Tim Toomey is the other. He's on the line. I will start uh, this, this program with the first several slides and then turn it over to Tim for some more, and then we'll go back and forth. Both of us have many years experience as architects and as lawyers dealing with multifamily housing and condominium issues, including claims and lawsuits. So we're both hopeful that we can share some of that experience with you and uh, you'll learn from some of these issues. Next slide, Hostin. So yes, condos happen, don't they? Well, yes, they do. Um, we assume you are keenly interested in this topic because you want to either design condos or maybe you have a morbid curiosity about condos but either way they are big business for architects and we hope to clue you in on some of the issues you should know about we have a lot to cover so let's get started awesome. next slide so so what is unique about condo projects why would we have a program just dealing with condo projects. Well, owners and, uh, excuse me, architect and contractors work for an owner that will not be an ultimate owner and occupant of the building units. So the, uh, the developer owner is going to develop that project, sell the units. The unit owners will then become homeowners essentially in the condo projects. And as most, if not all of you know, uh, when you own a home or a condominium, you take issues with your home very seriously, very personally, because they represent a big investment. They're highly, and usually in highly desirable locations, and hopefully we're all living in luxury, maintenance-free units. So they're highly emotional, and when they have issues, when owners of their homes and condos have issues, defects, problems, uh, they usually want someone to take care of that. And if they live in an apartment, then they can just call the landlord and the landlord will send somebody to fix it. But condo owners are responsible for their own expenses and those kinds of repairs in condominium units can often be very expensive. So they may be and usually are looking for someone else to pay for whatever it takes to fix their unit. Next slide. So yes, they're unique. Uh, client owners, your clients, the developers are usually incentivized to minimize construction costs. They're there to make a profit. They've developed these projects with, I'll just call it a greed motive, and profit motivates most developments. These clients are often just single purpose entities. They're LLCs with no assets. Uh, very undercapitalized normally. And what this means is that your client, after the project is developed and the building's turned over to the condominium association and the, the uh, units are sold, this means that that client may not, probably won't have the funds to deal with a claim. So again, there'll be a high likelihood that the owner will not have funds available to remedy any major defects and the condominium unit owners will be looking for other sources of funds to fix their problems. Next slide. So you're the architect. Hard to say this, harsh to, harsh to say this, but if you design condos, 
I'm afraid to say you you likely will be sued. That's a fact of life when you're designing condos. Uh, I say that from experience, and I'm sure Tim would join me in that. It's a cottage industry for lawyers. Uh, there are lawyers all around the country who have developed practices based on assembling a team of experts to thoroughly inspect projects and find defects. And trust me, they'll find some defects. Now, the defects could ultimately be related to maintenance issues, but once the defects are just pointed out to the condominium board, uh, they'll have to react. They will have a fiduciary duty to react to uh, uh, opinions by lawyers and their experts that show or that allege defects. So there are another there are a number of insurance issues with design condos. Some carriers will not provide a professional liability insurance to uh, firms who design condos uh, or condo provide condo related services, or they'll limit the amount of condo work that they will insure. So in other words. Uh, if a firm's business is, I'm just pick a number, more than 10% in the condo business, carrier may say, well, okay, uh, we'll only cover your projects up to 5% or 8%, something like that. Or they won't ask when it comes to looking for a, like a project specific insurance policy, which is a better alternative than using your own policy. Uh, many carriers will not even offer a project-specific policy for condominium projects, or if they do, then maybe not in certain parts of the country, such as uh, coastal, <clears throat> excuse me, coastal environments like Florida or South Carolina. Next, Tim, turning it over to you. Yeah, thanks, Craig, and uh, good morning or afternoon or evening, wherever you people are. <clears throat> Thank you for attending this webinar. Um, one of the key things that people can do to try and mitigate their risks on condo projects is to have a good go no go process or a client client selection and project selection process <clears throat> you need to find out whether or not the client is going to be the owner of the of the condominium at some point probably not um, and whether or not the owner is a developer of condos exclusively or apartments or both or are they a flipper will they build an apartment building and then flip it to condos what's their what's their track record <clears throat> also you want to if you can try and figure out the adequate adequacy of the developers capitalization you know their funding sources what track record do they have do they have a litigation history um, there are some condo well there are some multifamily developers in the country, whether or not they're condo owners who uh, build apartments and then flip to condos, but they have a terrible, terrible litigation history. Many of their projects end up with claims of various sorts. Um, you know, many of the owners of a, or a developer of a condominium project, even a multifamily project, is gonna be a limited liability company, an LLC of some sort or other. They're typically set up exclusively to run the project uh, they're rather thinly capitalized so um, you know that they probably are not going to be a great source of financial recourse should you have problems on the project including getting paid um, <clears throat> so do some uh, do some homework to try and figure out who's actually behind the project what's their history in this building type uh, what's their litigation experience uh, what are their interests in construction and material qualities? You know, do they uh, build, uh, you know, building types one versus three versus five? Are they stick built or are they uh, concrete and steel structures? Um, stick, the, stick built condos uh, generate a lot of claims themselves. So uh, kind of understand what the client's uh, history is regarding construction and material quality. I'll see you want to change that. <clears throat> also, try and determine whether or not the budget is adequate for the project, for the kinds of finishes the client claims that they want, for the quality of design that they claim they want and that you would hope to provide, um, and figure out whether or not there's a decent schedule for both your work to design the building 
and prepare the construction documents, but also to construct the building. Um, you know, too short a period of time to do the work that's necessary, uh, you know, increases the likelihood that, uh, you know, mistakes might be made. Above all, make sure you've got an adequate design fee for the work that you're going to do. Uh, if you don't have enough, uh, you're going to be feeling yourself squeezed to cut back on services. That is not going to be good for avoiding risk on the project. And um, the uh, figure out what the quality and the experience of the design and construction teams are. If you're the architect, you probably will be hiring most of the major consultants like the MEP and structural and fire protection. You might not, the owner might be doing that themselves, but regardless of who hires the design team, what's their track record? Do you have, have you worked with them in the past, successfully worked with them in the past? Um, and the construction team as well, if you know that, in advance and can figure out who the contractor is or the CM, who are the, who are the main trade contractors. Those would all be important pieces of information to know because ones who don't have the experience or have bad experiences are going to represent greater risks on the project. Hopsi, thank you. Also, figure out whether or not the project, uh, while maybe built as an apartment building to begin with, is it, do you know it's going to be converted to a condo at some point? Many projects know that in advance. Others don't. What's the developer's uh, MO for doing these kinds of projects? In many ways, a project that's designed initially as an apartment or multifamily, you know, rental unit, um, when it gets converted to a condo, that increases the risk for the design professional. We'll talk about some of that stuff a little later in the presentation, but uh, what, a, what an architect does to design to uh, uh, the standards required for a multifamily uh, rental uh, project can be different than for a condominium project. And um, Craig will have an example of that at the end of our presentation. Um, so uh, some of these uh, program or design elements financial model that may make the building less desirable for conversion. Uh, you know, do some evaluation of that. Do a little bit uh, of homework on this issue. Are there going to be restrictive covenants that prevent the developer from converting the condos uh, within any, particularly, any particular period of time? And sometimes these so-called restrictive covenants can be kind of tricky, uh, may not be enforceable under applicable law. Uh, try and cover yourselves in your contract with the client for a multifamily residential uh, apartment complex to get a restrictive covenant in there if you can. Um, in my experience, uh, you know, a good percentage of them are willing to do that if they truly don't in intend to convert to condos. Uh, if they balk at that, that's possibly a red flag and they either want to keep their options open often at your expense, or they're not necessarily being upfront and transparent with you. And if you can, uh, you know, obtain project-specific professional liability insurance for a condominium project. We'll talk about that in more detail later. But just know that trying to get project-specific coverage for a, a, a conversion project, a, a, an apartment project, rental apartment project that gets converted to condominiums is pretty much near impossible once construction has started. So you may not have that as an option uh, to pursue. Next slide, please. Also, as Craig mentioned, um, most insurers of professional liability insurance want you to disclose whether or not you do condominium work. And if so, what, what percentage of your book of business is condominium work? That uh, uh, goes into the risk analysis that the underwriters employ to uh, determine what your premiums are and they, they may also put conditions on it as Craig mentioned to limit the amount of condo work that you actually do. Um, know that project specific professional liability insurance if you're interested in that talk to your broker obviously uh, but for condominium projects if it's available from your bro from your insurer uh, it, it's usually uh, quite uh, inex quite expensive, 
it's not uh, it's not uh, it's a lot more expensive than your practice policies um, and there aren't that many professional liability insurers who will provide project specific professional liability insurance for condominium projects and as Craig oh. also mentioned certain states and areas of the country have more claims in litigation than others um, for various reasons uh, some of them are uh, tied to some legal issues that a couple of noted here the so-called economic loss doctrine which um, if in place in the jurisdiction where the project is being built would preclude a contractor from being able to sue the architect uh, you know for um, uh, any contract-based actions um, uh, so you, you might have some protection in the jurisdiction that follows the economic loss doctrine if it doesn't, then uh, you're more at risk of being sued directly by the contractor. Also, uh, various states have different discovery rules about what can and can't be uh, discovered for purposes of uh, bringing claims and stuff. So um, look into that a little bit. If you, your broker would probably be able to give you advice. If you don't have an attorney, your broker would probably be able to give you advice in that regard. Uh, next slide, please, Craig. Okay, so we're getting there, mitigating the risk. We set up some risk. There are others, but what do you do to mitigate the risk? Well, let's talk about the architect and consultant team selection. So first, first of all, this is not business as usual designing condominium projects. Uh, you may know that every project is unique, of course, but there's something different about the condo projects because of the issues we've raised. So you should have a team of architects or whoever's on your team in, in your office to understand the risks, understand where the risks come from, From uh, and we'll talk about it a little later, the different uh, aspects of a condo project. But don't underestimate the skills necessary to provide a, a quality project and good set of documents. So same with consultants. If you have an MEP as an example, an MEP engineer who's never done a condo project, then our suggestion is you should find an MEP who has good experience, a lot of experience with condominium projects, because there are specific issues that come up, risky issues, uh, with regard to MEP design and condominium projects we'll talk about. And then also, you need to have a successful prior working relationship with the consultants. Consultants that uh, you work with, you can trust, you know their patterns, and you're, you can coordinate with them, and you haven't had issues dealing with them. Better not to experiment on a condominium project with a new consultant. Next slide, please. So what about the uh, contract risk allocation provisions? What can you do with a contract? So let's look at limitation of liability clauses. Uh, you probably are aware of that kind of clause, the limitation of liability to, for example, a fee or insurance. You probably see those from time to time with certain consultants, geotechnical engineers, or, or if you ever retain the services of those consultants or are quite accustomed to including those in their contracts. Architects aren't quite used to that. For a condominium project, that's something you should definitely look at, a limitation of liability clause. Uh, also, when it comes to value engineering, the first thought that I have and that you should have is no good deed goes unpunished. And you've probably heard that before, but many claims, I don't just condominium projects, but especially condominium projects start with VE decisions. And usually, as you know, value engineering starts with the contractor. And the contractors are proposing cost uh, changes, VE, so their client can save money on a project, your client saves money on the project, but guess what? That means they're asking you to make a design change. And if you accept a VE and change your drawings and that issue becomes a problem, you're going to own that problem because of the change to the drawings. So beware of VE and diminishing the value of a project and the quality. Even an owner identification architect for damage under 
for uh, for damages arising from VE is probably won't connect, uh, won't protect you. One final thing you might look at is on for this slide is an owner identification of the architect for damage or losses that are in excess of your professional liability coverage. Uh, don't be afraid to ask the client for that one. So if you have uh, what could be a catastrophic claim of coming from a condo project that exceeds your liability insurance and puts your firm assets at risk, that's not good for you or for your clients. So uh, that's something that they can get insurance for in an owner protective policy. So don't be afraid to ask for that. Next slide, please. Okay, you're there. Uh, well, I want to back up one slide. Yeah, back up one slide. I'll see, there you go. So one one contract risk allocation provision you can ask for is uh, in they, your client's indemnification of you for their directed non-architect approved VE changes. So a minute ago I was talking about VE changes where you change your drawings. What happens if the contractor proposes something and you don't change your drawing because you don't support that VE change? It's quite possible that you won't approve a VE change. It'll get implemented without your approval. It becomes an owner accepted uh, non-conforming work. But if that issue later becomes a problem, you could get dragged into a claim until it all gets sorted out and you'll be spending money defending that claim. So uh, the uh, client owner identification of you in a circumstance like that would be advisable to, to look into. And you can talk to your insurance broker or lawyer about that. Also waivers of subrogation. Uh, property insurance carriers may, uh, if there is a claim with property damage, they may cover that claim and they may pay for some property damage. But what but the insurance carrier then will be looking for a source to repay the carrier for the money they paid out in the claim. And that takes a form of a subrogation case or lawsuit against targets like architects and contractors. So you will want to make sure you have a waiver of subrogation clause in your contract. Also, waiver of consequential damages. As you may know, the AIA uh, included a waiver of consequential damages clause in the in the contract documents uh, back in I think it was two was a 97 or 2007 I've forgotten now but it's it's in the current documents and waiver of consequential damages clause will help you in the event there's a claim and the, the claim includes issues such as loss of income uh, extra living expenses for condominium unit owners who have to move, their moving expenses, those kinds of damages not directly related to the property itself. Next slide. Additional contract terms that you should be considering is, and this, this first one is included in the AI contract, are no third party beneficiary clause, meaning that the only party who can benefit or ha can enforce the contract, the terms of the contract, is your client. And third parties, unless they're specifically identified in the contract, cannot take advantage of the contract terms and make a claim or sue you based on the contract terms. <laughs> Clauses related to the developer marketing the project and accurately describing what the project is. Uh, as you probably know, your clients, some of your clients may, uh, what, the, what the, the law calls puff, puffery, puffing, they may overemphasize the quality of the, of the project you've designed and not, not really lay out the true aspects of it. And if you want to, if you can, have contract terms that require the developer to, to limit its overzealous and, and overstated marketing. You should also consider uh, having a contract term that says that your client cannot use your name and logo in marketing materials. The issue here is that uh, in the event that your client does overstate the quality of the, the project and uses your name in connection with that marketing, 
that you run the risk then of having uh, potential claimants or plaintiffs in lawsuits believe that you are part of that overstatement of the quality of the project and blame you for some of that. You also would like to have input for making recommendations for condo maintenance in the condominium documents themselves. You can, this is something that you can also include in your contract and even include the kinds of maintenance issues that you expect your client, the owner, developer, to include in the condominium documents, such as making each unit owner responsible for routine, routine maintenance, uh, having the Condo Owners Association be responsible for maintaining the common areas, and that the, the association must maintain appropriate insurance. The issues that can come uh, can arise from this is, as you may know, many claims and many problems result in condominium projects down the road after they've been open for a few years because of a lack of maintenance, because the unit owners want to keep the, and the association want to keep the the dues as low as possible. And when the dues aren't high enough to maintain the project, then of course problems can arise. Tim? All right, thanks, Craig. Let me talk a little bit about mitigating risk through uh, insurance provision. Hasi, can you get on 17, please? Okay. Right. Um, so we've mentioned uh, project specific professional liability insurance. Uh, if you obtain that, uh, you can you can buy that insurance for fixed periods of time. And what you're interested in, if you can obtain it, is to get that insurance to last through the statute of limitations and repose period. So for some states like California, which has a 10-year statute of repose for most claims uh, regarding professional liability matters, you would like your insurance to be in effect, your project-specific insurance to be in effect through the statutory repose period so that if and when a claim is brought against you, you know that you can have the, the policy proceeds to back you up. What you don't want to have happen is to have your policy lapse or expire within the last few years of the repose period because, um, as Craig mentioned, there's a cotton industry of lawyers here who go around looking for condominium projects who are uh, running towards the end of the statutory repose period. And then they go to the association, the board, HOA, whatever it's called, and say, you know, here, we can help you out. We'll do an evaluation of the facility. And if there are any problems, you know, maybe you can collect money from your architects and the contractors. So you, uh, it's interesting that most claims on condos come within the first couple of years after the project is uh, uh, substantially complete, you know, sort of the shakedown period, whatever real issues are there usually come out in the first few years. And then towards the end of the uh, statutory repose period, when you have these uh, <clears throat> not necessarily so savory lawyers running around trying to make money for themselves. Anyway, um, so check check with uh, your broker as well as uh, if you have counsel, what's the applicable statutory period and see if you can get coverage to last through that period of time. It's not cheap as I mentioned previously, but it's really great if you can have it. Um, and try hard in your contract to get the owner to pay the premiums for your project specific policy as well as all your deductibles or self-insured retentions, SIRs. It's not impossible to do it. You won't always get it. If you get it though, that's great. This is all part of a process of making your client understand that the condominium project is a risky project for you, but it's also a risky project for the owner. Having a well-insured project wherever that insurance lies, whether on the owner's side or the architect's side or the contractor's side. It's important for all parties that the project be adequately insured through the whole risk period. Likewise, you wanna make sure that your consultants carry appropriate insurance. Um, if you get a project specific policy, you'll be including those consultants uh, as insured on that policy. But you wanna make sure that they've got adequate insurance of their own on their practice policies, that those practices policies, including yours, will sit excess 
of any project specific policy so that if there isn't enough money to pay out under a project specific policy, you and your consultants separate practice policies are available uh, to the uh, tune of their limits to help pay for any claims. So making sure your consultants are adequately insured is incredibly important. Also, there's a, there's a product out there called Owner Protected Professional Indemnity Insurance, OPPI insurance, which protects the owner against uh, claims arising out of faulty work on the part of the architect or the other design consultant. It's not, a, it's not like the professional liability insurance, which protects the architect. This, this OPPI insurance protects the owner. Um, and it's about, well, I don't know, roughly half as expensive as professional liability insurance. So uh, you may want to structure a program where if you can't get enough professional liability insurance, project-specific professional liability insurance, that a, a second, uh, second layer of OPPI coverage is purchased by the owner. Next slide, please. Um, likewise, on the contractor side, you would desirable to have the contractor or the CM get specific CGL coverage, uh, commercial general liability coverage, general liability coverage. Um, and, um, you know, if in any situation where there's not enough coverage, then those who feel like they've been damaged will go looking somewhere else to get insurance. So if the contractor or the CM side of the project doesn't have adequate coverage, that's going to put more pressure on potential plaintiff bring claims against you. Um, you can get, or the contract and the CM can get a specific professional liability coverage for delegated design or design build elements of the project. You know, lots of times projects, particularly some kinds of condominium projects, particularly stick built projects and things, some of that work, um, some of the MEP work, uh, you know, fire sprinklers and stuff like that might be done on a, on a, a delegated design basis. Anytime the, des the construction team, whether it's the contractor or, or trade contractors who the contractor hires, performs design services, you want to make sure that the actual uh, entities doing the design work are adequately insured. And also, you want to have a builder's, or you want the owner typically sometimes the contractor, but usually the owner gets a builder's risk policy, which covers a broad uh, range of risks on, on a project. Um, these are typically non-controversial kinds of things uh, for owners to get, but you want to make sure that's in place. Um, next slide, Craig, it's you. Yes, sir. Thank you, Tim. So what you see on this slide are issues, consultant services, and other issues that, if possible, you'd be better served for these for the, these consulting services to be retained directly by your client, the owner, the developer. So I won't go through in detail each one of these, but I'll mention a few issues. For example, acoustic consultant. One one uh, big area of claims on condominium projects is sound transmission between walls, obviously, but also between floors. And one of the one of the worst conditions is bare feet on a wood floor. So acoustic issues are problematic. Obviously, the envelope is a problem when you've got water infiltration issues. So uh, an envelope consultant should be retained on a condominium project preferably by your client, but if not by your client, then certainly by you. Same with ADA, FHA issues uh, and codes. The code consultant can cover all of that. It's good to have a peer review by your client. If there are issues, then your, your client's peer reviewer can hopefully find those, and that's always helpful. Uh, constructability, pool consultants, if you've got a swimming pool, better to have a pool consultant under contract to your client. I can't tell you how many pool-related claims I've seen. You can imagine how bad they can be. When it comes to mock-ups, you should always, always, always have a mock-up. The contractor build a full-size mock-up of your exterior wall condition, window openings, uh, sliding doors, any kind of any kind of opening, and. Oftentimes that's a target for value engineering, but you should insist, you should never agree to delete mock-ups from your projects. 
commissioning and sustainability issues, those are pretty pretty obvious. So the highest risks are related to acoustics, the envelope, ADA, FHA, and interestingly, MEP issues are quite common in claims for condominium projects related to transmission of smells, basically from kitchens, from cooking, uh, from under pressurization, and just other mechanical related issues, plumbing issues, water hammers. So MEP is, is a, an area of concern. Better to have that, maybe even design build, if you can, if you're going to have that under your contract, take it through uh, design phase but then turn it over to a contractor sub and let the contractor take it into construction documents and construction. So better to have these contracted directly to your client if not possible, if that is not possible, just make sure in your contract terms and I've seen contract terms on this point, make sure you don't assume responsibilities for reviewing the other consultants work on not under your contract for coordinating it and just basically taking responsibility for what they're doing. And I've seen, like I said, contract language where our clients have asked us to do that. Now, and I'm not saying you can't coordinate with them. Of course, every project must have a coordination process, but I'm talking about coordinating their internal work, being responsible for making sure that the diffusers are in the right place, for example. They should be responsible for coordinating coordinating those kinds of issues with you. Uh, next slide for Tim. Thanks. Okay, so <clears throat> one one great area in which you might uh, serve yourself to reduce risk on condo projects is in the content of the various condo documents that the uh, condominium developer has to prepare for the project and file with the applicable state agencies. Some of the provisions that would greatly help reduce and minimize your risk uh, are on the next several slides here. So I want to I want to go through these. And the more of these that you can get written into the condo documents, the better. In order to do so, you need to, in your contract with the developer owner, you need to obligate them, and they of course need to agree, to include these kinds of provisions uh, in their condo documentation. Um, I say we're we're more often successful than not in getting at least some of these into our contracts with our clients. Uh, in a few projects, we've gotten virtually all of them. Uh, so they're they're really they're really quite helpful, and a a good condominium owner. Uh, I'm sorry, developer who knows the business and has been around the block a few times. Most of these are going to be in their benefit as well. That they might they might jump the gun and offer these things anyway without you even asking for them. Um, so some of the more important ones are requiring the owner to to obligate the um, HOA homeowners association to have a super majority for authorizing suit. So no, no, uh, you know, the HOA is a representative board of the condominium unit owners. So you'd want them to vote, let's say, super majority of two thirds uh, to authorize suit by the HOA against the architect. Um, if, uh, if it's harder to, for a super majority to get, uh, to be achieved, and so that would reduce the chances of a suit against you. Um, it's in incredibly important to obligate the HOA to timely maintenance their common, the common elements of the project, the hallways, the lobbies, the grounds, and so on. Um, maintenance or the lack of maintenance is one of the biggest reasons for claims later by either the HOA or individual unit owners against design professionals. Uh, nobody puts aside enough money to maintain the building. You know, the exterior needs to be painted or if it's wood, it needs to be clean. It needs to be caulked and pointed if it's brick. Uh, new roofs need to be put on periodically, um, things of that sort. So HOAs typically don't budget enough for those kinds of things. And then they go looking for pocketbooks from which they can get some money. Uh, likewise, you wanna obligate 
have the condominium owners, the individual unit owners, obligated to maintain their units as well. Uh, so many, so frequently, condo individual condo unit owners don't do that. Some are under the mistaken notion that the HOA is supposed to do that for them, or that their monthly dues uh, covers maintenance to their individual units, uh, the interiors typically, and that's not the case. It's lack of knowledge on the part of the condo owners. They don't read their condominium documents. Uh, there's all sorts of variety of reasons, but you want to get yourself covered to make sure that at least they're obligated to provide adequate uh, maintenance for their units. And um, to, to establish funds and establish the, you know, the, the level of funding for the very, both for the HOA and the individual unit owners uh, to um, to maintenance their facilities, they're typically woefully ignorant of how much it actually costs to maintain over time uh, the common elements of the building as well as their individual units. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Um, it, whoops, too many. Go back one, please. Thanks. Um, so, if uh, if you've got these provisions in there uh, regarding maintenance, you'd also like to include a, a provision whereby the HOA and the condo owners release the architect from any liability should they fail to comply with their maintenance obligations. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it would seem to make sense, but having a having an express provision in the condominium documents to that effect can be very helpful uh, in getting the architect off the hook for those kinds of claims. Um, require the HOA before it brings an action against an architect to hire knowledgeable experts. You know, preferably uh, people who you know other architects who are experienced with. Uh, designing and um, maintenancing uh, condominiums who can opine as to the appropriateness of the HOA or HOA's claim or potential claim against the architect. Many since these HOAs are typically populated by individual unit owners, you know, who stand up and say, "Okay, I'll serve on the HOA board," uh, but they don't know anything about uh, uh, design or construction. Usually, what they do is field uh, complaints from the rest of the from the rest of the condominium unit owners. So their their uh, their lens on how they view matters is totally on uh, you know self interest kinds of things. So require them to hire knowledgeable experts who have a better chance of being unbiased. They won't always be, but have a better chance of being unbiased and can do a little bit of education for the HOA on what the real issues are and who's really responsible for that. Also, importantly, include a provision in your HOA in the uh, condominium documents that that suits can, by against architects can only be brought by the HOA, not by individual owners. If you're designing a condominium with a project with 500 individual units, you're going to have 500 different points of view about what an architect should or shouldn't have done on that project. There's no way you can win in that situation. There's going to be some people who feel that you did something wrong, regardless. So if you can get rid of the individual unit owner claims and only have claims brought against you by the HOA, that, that provides a certain filter uh, through which uh, serious claims might be avoided. As Craig mentioned uh, regarding uh, your contracts, include in the uh, condominium documents uh, for a waiver of subrogation that, that any insurance uh, uh, that uh, provides coverage for the HOA or the individual unit owners, that those insurers waive subrogation, their subrogation rights, so that they can't turn around after making a claim payout and sue the architect or others uh, for what they paid out in claims to their insurers. Next slide, please. Next slide. Here we go. Okay. Um, also, since you know, it's quite likely that you are going to have some claims at some point here. The, the risks are just very high. This is a, a matter of interest. You might want to know that most professional liability insurers um, will claim that they pay out more in in uh, damages under their policies than they take in in premiums. So you wonder why anybody, 
provides professional liability insurance for condominium projects. But for various reasons, uh, there are, you know, several insurers who do maybe a handful who are long-term players, another handful who are short-term players probably won't be around too long. And then there's a whole bunch who were in the market once and got out of it because they just lost their shirts. Anyway, in your condo documents, you want to set up a methodology and a process for how to handle disputes, you know, some kind of a reasonable process. Um, ideally, you know, you'd like to have mediation as a condition precedent before binding dispute resolution so that uh, this would be non-binding mediation where the HOA and the architect can sit down and talk about the issues and with the coding advice, you know, cajoling of the mediator, you might get a settlement that's reasonably acceptable to the parties <clears throat> before you incur the costs of time-consuming and expensive litigation or arbitration. <clears throat> if you have litigation as the uh, final methodology to resolve disputes, you as the architect would almost certainly want to have a waiver of a jury trial. You don't want to have your claim or the HOA or unit owner's claim against you go before a jury. Most of the people in the jury are going to be homeowners themselves. They're going to be sympathetic to other homeowners like the individual unit owners. And they're going to assume that you've got lots of insurance and so the money is really coming out of the insurance pockets. So they're less inclined to a super close attention to the facts of trial or to the law that the judge will instruct them on, and rather they'll vote, you know, they'll vote as a jury uh, by their guts. So uh, a waive, waiver of jury trial would be usually very helpful. Um, some states require arbitration, a state mandated arbitration process rather than going to court. Uh, if the state mandates that you're kind of stuck with that process. Um, trial, either trial or arbitration can be very expensive. So you really want to avoid it whenever you can. That's why I give mediation a good shot at that succeeding. Then you also want to require the HOA and the condo unit owners to carry adequate property insurance and with the waiver of subrogation provisions I previously mentioned, because if there's adequate insurance there, then it's highly likely that they're not going to bring a claim against you. They got their money, they'll fix their ceiling, they'll fix the leaky walls, whatever. Um, and if you have the waiver of subrogation, then the insurers won't be able to come back against you to try and collect for the cost that they had to pay to fix the unit owner's leaky walls. Next slide, please. A couple other things here. Uh, Oftentimes, the units in the condominium project are what are called white boxes. They're just, you know, the shell of the individual unit, and the owners uh, retain their own architects, interior designers, other consultants to basically fit out their condo. Um, you know, so uh, you want a disclaimer in your in the condominium documents of any responsibility uh, on the part of you as the architect for the individual unit owners fit out of their white box units. Also, if you can get it, if you'd like the HOA and the condo owners to agree to indemnify you against any claims arising out of their retention of individual design professionals to fit out their uh, individual condo units. It's not unusual for these individual consultants to fit out a, uh, an individual unit. They, they don't carry necessarily a whole lot of insurance. Um, they're doing small small projects, small policies, but if there's a big claim um, and they haven't got enough insurance, you know, the unit owner is gonna go on, wanna go looking for others who might have more money. So you might be a target. So get that indemnity if it's all possible. And for the same reasons that Craig mentioned for wanting to get uh, no third party beneficiary provisions in your contracts with your client, you'd also like the client to include uh, similar types of no third party beneficiary provisions in the condominium documents so that other parties like insurers um, uh, can't claim that they have any rights underneath the, uh, the condominium documents to step in the shoes of the of the individual unit owners or the HOA and bring claims against you for 
you know, alleged problems. Lastly, um, you'd want a provision in your agreement with your owner, owner developer, that uh, you are going to be given copies of all the con condominium documents filed by the developer and the HOA uh, for a couple reasons. One is you want to make sure that if, a, if there were any agreements to have certain provisions in the condo documents, this is how you're going to be able to verify uh, that, in fact, they've been included. Um, and also, by having a copy of these things, uh, you know, if and when, uh, you know, the rumblings of a possible claim start developing, you can look into those documents and help prepare yourself and evaluate whether or not they're likely to be successful in bringing a claim against you. Are you adequately covered in those condo documents? And if not, at least it's better to be forewarned than not know what's going to happen at all. So I can't stress the importance of uh, using the content of the condominium documents as the vehicle to help mitigate uh, risk of claims against you by the HOA as well as the individual unit owners. Uh, next slide, Craig. Thanks, Tim. So let's talk about how things can really go wrong in certain with certain respects. Uh, this is a project in San Francisco, the Beacon is the name of it. It's uh, roughly catty-cornered from Pac Bell Park. So that case, it's in California, obviously. The contract, next slide, please. So the contract was executed for this project in 2000. The project was completed in 2004. The lawsuit was filed in 2009. And that lawsuit was finally concluded in 2016 after seven years of litigation. So what was the issue here? First of all, this project started out as a four rent residential mixed use project. It was a rental, uh, apartment rentals project, not a condominium project. 595 units, pretty big project. So the client, did not want to pay for installed air conditioning in the project, mm -hmm. rather wanting to rely on natural ventilation. During the pro process of, of uh, developing the project and creating the drawings and going through that process, the original developer sold the project to another developer. That developer then converted the project to condominiums. And therein lies the problem, one of the problems that Tim's pointed out. So after the project was completed, buyers were informed that there's no air conditioning. Some of the units on the west side of the project will be a little warm in the summer. You should have, the buyers were informed they should have uh, ceiling fans and other alternate forms of, of ventilation, uh, should buy blinds to keep out the sun. All that, all those issues were, were disclosed and discussed with the, with the purchasers. However, nevertheless, as predicted, the, some of those units, less than 10 out of 595 on the west side of the project, got a little warm when, on, the, on the warmest days, the hottest days, and some of the in internal temperatures in those units reached as high as 85 degrees. So the Condominium Owners Association filed suit. Next slide, please. So then what was their claim? This was this is taken right out of the lawsuit. Plaintiff alleged solar heat gain, which made the condo units uninhabitable and unsafe during certain periods due to high temperatures. And due to, to the defendants, this is now the architects are talking about approval, contrary to state and local building codes of less expensive substandard windows in a building sign that lasts adequate ventilation. Well, the fallacy here was that the building met code. There was no substandard or less expensive or non-code compliant windows. The issue was that the client dictated no air conditioning to cool, only natural ventilation. There were code requirements that limited the opening, the size uh, uh, opening sizes for the windows because of noise issues. So, like as I said, less than 10 units had temperatures in that range. And like I said, the owners were informed of all these potential issues, at least the, uh, the, the temperature rise that could happen. Next slide, please. So the issue presented, whether or not design professionals owe a duty of care to homeowners association and its members in the absence of privity, meaning in the absence of the architect 
having a contract with the homeowners association and the unit owners. A little bit of history here. In the trial court, the architects filed a motion to dismiss due to lack of privity, and that was granted. The homeowners association appealed that decision. The appeals court reversed the trial court, concluding that the California's, the California's Right to Repair Act, which includes the architect's right to repair, inspect, and repair condominiums, expressed a legislative intent to impose a duty on to future homeowners by the architect. That went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court affirmed the Court of Appeals. Next slide, please. And what did they say? Uh, building on substantial case law, common law principle, and common law principles, we hold the architect owes a duty of care to future homeowners. Whereas here, the architect is principal architect on the project, and they also added and was was highly compensated, if that makes you feel any better. And they say that this is the real kicker, that the duty of care extends to such architects even when they do not actually build a project or exercise, and I should underline this, or exercise ultimate control over construction. And, and also I would add, ultimate control over the design decisions, which of course, the design decision that at issue here is the lack of air conditioning. So they affirmed the Court of Appeals uh, decision. Next slide, please. So blah, 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 on with the decision. It would be, pat this is, and this is the part that, that should scare you. It would be patently inconsistent with public policy to hold that an architect's failure to exercise due care in designing a building can be justified by client interests at odds with the interests of prospective homeowners and safety and habitability. Well, here, again, the only habitability or, habitability or safety issue was the air conditioning issue. Now, there were other issues, the, the laundry list of usual things that, that they would bring up, that condominium owners would bring up in a, in a case like this, but they were none of those were serious. They were run of the mill, a leaky window here, things like that. The big driving issue was a lack of air conditioning. And again, it complied with all relevant codes. So there, again, the client didn't want the air conditioning. Many San Francisco apartments don't have air conditioning. Many homes in San Francisco don't have air conditioning. In fact, I remember checking into a hotel that didn't have air conditioning. Of course, I would never do that again. So danger looks, lurks around every corner, even when you have good contract terms. And this particular contract did have a no third party beneficiary clause in it. The California Supreme Court refused to enforce that clause and their rationale as stated in the case was just by virtue of the fact that the architect had a clause like that in the contract meant to the Supreme Court that the architect should expect to have a duty to third parties so we're not going to enforce it they said. Next slide please. So Condos do happen. Should they? Well, they're going to happen. But maybe you don't want to go to California, maybe not Florida, where there are many condo claims related to moisture and mold. Uh, and you can see the other <laughs> the other states. I'd say if you build, if you design it, they will sue. Tim. Yeah, there are, uh, well, I don't know, pick a state. There are lots of states where you've got problems. Um, you know, New Jersey particularly, in my experience, uh, Southern California, again, my experience, um, Illinois. Um, not surprisingly, these are, these are some of the jurisdictions that are most attractive for condominium developers. Uh, they bring in some of the higher higher profile types of condominium projects um, and usually uh, the more expensive the project the more entitled the owner feels to whatever they think they're entitled to so claims generally are generated from that kind of a mindset anyway i, I think do we have any time at all left Hosky, for questions we are right at the three o'clock hour, so we can wrap up here with contact and resources. You can see on your screen, we've got AIA Risk Management Committee webpage listed, as well as 
the AIA contract document learn page for additional uh, training and education. If you have any questions about AIA contract document content or the online service, you can uh, contact the uh, contact lines listed on the slide. You will be receiving the PowerPoint along with the recording of today's session by early next week and your credit for attending today's session if you indicated an AIA member number when you registered will be reported directly to the AIA uh, within two weeks. So with that, I want to thank our presenters for a very thorough and interesting presentation. And I want to thank all of our attendees for taking the time to join us today. Have a great afternoon.